A hero to some. A monster to others. He hoped to start a third world war. The CIA and American special forces conspired to bring him down. His death is shrouded in mystery, his body secretly buried in an unmarked grave. But the man they hoped the world would forget is the man who would become a legend. He's a man lionized by youth and revolutionaries around the world. The face on millions of t-shirts. But the real Che Guevara was not a two-dimensional image, but a complex man with an unwavering goal. Che described being a guerrilla as the highest form of humankind. Someone who was prepared to sacrifice himself for an ideal, in his case, and it was for the cause of Marxism-Leninism, the solution to mankind's ills, and the only way to turn around the world order from one dominated by Yankee capitalism. In author John Lee Anderson's best-selling biography, Che Guevara, A Revolutionary Life, he explores the man behind the myth. First and foremost, I wanted to know what had led this well-born son of an affluent old Argentine family, a son of the middle class, with everything going for him, to leave that comfortable existence and become the most implacable, well-known revolutionary of his day. May 14, 1928. Che Guevara is born Ernesto Guevara de la Serna in the city of Rosario, Argentina. Ernesto Guevara Lynch was Che's father. Celia was from an illustrious Spanish family. They were considered to be of the upper class. Carlos Figueroa is a childhood friend of Ernesto's. Ernesto didn't discriminate. He would hang out with all the kids, whether they were children of privilege or the children of servants. The eldest of four children, Ernesto is afflicted with chronic asthma, a condition that haunts him throughout his life. The family moves to the hill town of Alta Gracia, hoping the drier climate will help their sick son. In Alta Gracia, Ernesto meets Calica Ferrer. The boys and girls would gather around to dance, but Ernesto was a really bad dancer. He had a bad ear. We'd be playing one style of music, and he'd be dancing to another. The adolescent Ernesto was known for being hypersexual. His first experience was with the family maid. He would try to seduce any woman of any shape, age, or appearance. One of Ernesto's more unusual traits is his lack of hygiene, which earns him the nickname Chancho, meaning pig in Spanish. He had a shirt called the Weekly Shirt because he would only change it once a week. We called him Chancho, and it stuck with him ever since. But he didn't mind. He kind of liked it. Yet for all Ernesto's wild antics, he possesses a very introspective side. He was always searching um, for a kind of the meaning for life. He was more advanced than his peers. He read serious authors. Nehru and Gandhi and Steinbeck and Faulkner and Mussolini. He was a voracious reader. Though he enrolls in medical school, Ernesto's true education comes from the trips he takes through undeveloped Latin America. Alberto Granado was an older student. He proposed that the two take off for a journey by motorbike the length of Latin America. It was a quest to look beyond the privileged confines that were his birthright. Putting his medical degree on hold, Ernesto and Alberto head out on an old Norton motorbike nicknamed La Ponderosa II 
on January 4th, 1952. All we could see was the dust on the road ahead and ourselves on the bike, devouring kilometers in our flight northward. They traveled down to Patagonia and across to Chile, where La Poderosa finally gave out. Ditching the bike, they travel on foot and hitch rides on the back of trucks, heading for the interior of Chile. They traveled up to see the world's greatest open pit copper mine, Chuquicamata, which loomed large in the imaginations of Latin Americans in the time because it was US owned and run. It was this notion of the kind of monstrous capitalist enterprise uh, exploiting the local workers. American companies like Anaconda and Kencott monopolized Chile's mining industry. American companies went to Latin America for two reasons. Cheap raw materials and cheap wages. To a young nationalist and a young idealist of the early 1950s, it would be very hard to look upon U.S. policies as practiced in Latin America kindly. He saw something that he hadn't seen before. He saw the face of poverty. In America, Ernesto, being who he was, was terribly bothered by what he had seen. From Chile, Ernesto and Alberto head to Peru and then continue on to Venezuela. After seven months on the road, Alberto decides to stay in Venezuela, while Ernesto returns home to Buenos Aires to complete his last year at medical school with a new social conscience. All this wandering around, or America with a capital A, has changed me more than I thought. When he finished medical school, he said, See, you thought I couldn't do it, but I graduated. So pack your bags, because we're going to be leaving soon. Ernesto and Calica head for Bolivia. Along the way, they meet other young travelers. They were students. They had invited us to see Guatemala. Ernesto is intrigued by the students' political fervor and the situation in Guatemala, where President Jacobo Arbenz is attempting to bring about a social revolution through land reform. Arbenz was intent on nationalizing the unused land of the major uh, U.S. banana uh, and fruit companies, particularly United Fruit. Uh, of course, United Fruit was a company that had very close ties to the Eisenhower uh, administration. The Secretary of State John Foster Dulles had been on the board of United Fruit. John Foster Dulles was the brother of Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA. United Fruit paid a, a very skilled public relations specialist to kind of whip up a frenzy about the uh, threat of communism in this small, impoverished country of Guatemala. December 24th, 1953. It is amid this charged atmosphere that Ernesto first arrives in Guatemala. Soon he is introduced to a Peruvian woman named Hilda Gadea. Hilda immediately became besotted with him. She had even went to the point where she pawned some jewelry in order to keep him in his hostels. And eventually they began sleeping together. Hilda introduces Ernesto to followers of a 26-year-old Cuban lawyer named Fidel Castro. He had led an attack on the Moncada military barracks, the second largest military garrison in Cuba in an audacious attempt to overthrow Cuba's president, General Fulgencio Batista. Many of the people that attacked the barracks, a lot of whom were students, former students, workers, organizers, a lot of them were killed, tortured, killed. Uh, the ones that survived, including Fidel Castro and his brother, were sentenced to prison. Castro was serving a 15-year sentence, but Ernesto was deeply impressed with his men. Unlike his Cuban friends, Ernesto is not committed to any cause or ideology, but the ouster of Guatemala's president, Arbenz, changes his view. The first CIA-sponsored coup in Latin America took place in, in Guatemala in 1954. And essentially the army got scared and told Arbenz that he had to resign, and, and, and he did. Castillo Armas is placed in power on June 27, 1954. He's seen by many as an American puppet. He begins arresting suspected communists and anyone connected to the old regime. 
Threatened with jail and possibly execution, Ernesto takes refuge at the Argentine embassy. He came away convinced that the United States was, as he famously later called it, the enemy of humanity. Jacobo Arbenz Guzman succumbed before the cold, premeditated aggression of the USA, hidden behind a smokescreen of continental propaganda. Ernesto now considers himself a Marxist. Communism seemed to offer a way forward and a ready-made ideology for the kind of new society that could rise from the ashes of the old. Ernesto Guevara, he left Guatemala a very radicalized individual, looking now for a revolution he could fight in. September 1954. Like many other leftists, Ernesto heads for Mexico City, where former President Cardenas had successfully nationalized its oil fields in the 1930s. Mexico had a historic standing as one of the countries on the flank of the United States who had stood up to Yankee imperialism at the turn of the century. Ernesto reconnects with his Cuban friends and is introduced to Raul Castro. After serving 22 months in prison for his role in the Moncada siege, he has come to Mexico City to try and rebuild his older brother Fidel's organization. And they liked one another. He was a Marxist, as opposed to Fidel, who was still in prison. Succumbing to international pressure, Batista releases Fidel Castro after having only served a two-year sentence. He also heads for Mexico City. This was a person who had tried to overthrow a dictatorship dictatorship by the force of arms and what a lot of people consider almost like a, a brazen, crazy attack on the Moncada barracks. Now he was exiled from his homeland, and guess what? He was organizing to try and go back and do the same thing. Where Ernesto is reserved, serious, a communist, Fidel Castro was none of these things. He'd gotten into the rough and ready politics of his day and had positioned himself as a patriot and nationalist. He was not yet a Marxist-Leninist. August 1955, eager to meet the man who had stirred such passion in his followers, Ernesto asks Raul to arrange a meeting. The meeting lasts all night. Political occurrences having met Fidel Castro, a Cuban revolutionary, a young man, intelligent, very sure of himself, and of extraordinary audacity. I think there is a mutual sympathy between us. They share many of the same ambitions and the same nemesis, the United States. Ernesto is invited to join the July 26th movement, named after the date of the Moncada siege. The only non-Cuban in the group, he signs on as troop doctor and is given the nickname Che. Argentines say Che when they talk to one another. It's an old term meaning, hey, you. And so they began calling him Che. Hilda had been left behind in Guatemala. She now joins Che. Hilda announced that she was pregnant, which came as a bit of a blow. But curiously, he decided to do the right thing, and he married her. Soon after the birth of his daughter, Hildita, Che pours all his energy into the movement and the big push for Cuba. Almost immediately, he was off for long periods of time in a ranch outside Mexico City where they trained militarily. He turned out to be one of the best shots in the group. But word soon gets out, and Che, along with Fidel Castro and most of the July 26 movement members in the city, are arrested and detained. They're in jail for a month. Upon their release, the movement goes underground. Fidel Castro continues with his plans of overthrowing Batista and purchases a beat-up old boat for $15,000, appropriately named the Grandma, to take his small army of 82 from Mexico to Cuba. They anticipate a five-day journey. Che writes a letter to his mother informing her of his actions. Hilda is to mail it if he should die in battle in essence, saying his last goodbyes to Hilda and his young daughter, that if he survived, he would see them again. Uh, but, you know, the revolution called. 2 a.m. on the morning of November 25, 1955, 
82 men board the Grandma. With our lights extinguished, we left the port of Tuxpan amid an infernal mess of men and all sorts of material. Fidel's words began to take on reality. In 1956, we shall be free or we shall be martyrs. His cause was revolution in Latin America. The next objective was Cuba, to liberate Cuba. And he had ceased to call himself Ernesto Guevara. He had become Che. Twenty-seven-year-old Che Guevara has joined Fidel Castro and 80 others on an armed expedition to overthrow Cuban President Fulgencio Batista. On November 25, 1955, the small army boards an old boat named the Grandma and heads for Havana. Ninety miles off the Florida coast, the island of Cuba is enjoying benefits from its booming tourist industry. Havana was the whorehouse of the Caribbean. It was uh, a place where Americans went on dirty weekends. There were live sex shows, showgirls. It was full of prostitutes, drugs. It was a uh, sort of carnival atmosphere to which a lot of American tourists flocked. And there were some very positive aspects of it, but there was another Cuba, and the other Cuba was a Cuba that was basically run militarily by dictatorship. Although the Eisenhower administration supports Batista, most Cubans consider him a ruthless dictator. Fulgencio Batista was as much of a thug as, as ever governed uh, a Latin American country. Uh, he was somebody who was considered beholden to U.S. economic interests, to the interests of the U.S. mafia in Cuba. The seven-day passage aboard the Grandma has been turbulent. The entire boat took on an aspect both ridiculous and tragic. Men with anguished faces, holding their stomachs, some with their heads and pockets, others lying in the strangest positions, immobile, their clothing soiled with vomit. It was an unmitigated disaster. They lost their bearings, uh, they lost a man overboard, later saved him. Uh, when they eventually reached the coast of Cuba, they landed in the wrong place. They arrive in Cuba two days late and in broad daylight. As the old boat approaches Las Coloradas Beach, they hit a sandbar. Foundered and had to stumble ashore into a marsh. Before the troops have a chance to regroup, Batista's Air Force attacks and sends Che and the rest of Fidel Castro's men fleeing. They're able to evade enemy forces for the next three days. But on December 5th, their luck runs out. In a matter of seconds, a hurricane of bullets. This only added to the Dantesque and grotesque scenes around us. Stout guerrillero trying to hide behind a single stalk of sugarcane. And another without really knowing why, crying out for silence in the midst of a tremendous uproar. More than two thirds were massacred immediately. Che was wounded in the neck. He had to make a split second choice between taking with him his rifle and ammunition or the first aid kit. He left the first aid kit and took the ammunition. When Che finally reunites with Fidel Castro and the others, he's shocked to see how small the group is. Only 17 of the original 82 men on board the Grandma, amongst them Che and the Castro brothers, Fidel and Raul, were amongst the survivors. The invasion was such a disaster that news reports initially sent out the news that Fidel and Che had died. Fidel Castro, Che, and the others regroup and move towards the Sierra Maestra mountain range. The Sierra Maestra was the mountain range nearest the coast where they landed and where Fidel planned to base his guerrilla movement. The Sierra Maestra is home to renegades, smugglers, and a hardy peasant population. 
en aquellos momentos... Either were I or the other farmers in the area aware that there was a revolutionary movement taking place. It took us by surprise. I knew nothing about politics. 16-year-old Dariel Ramirez, nicknamed Benigno, works on his father's farm in the Sierra Maestra. They arrived at my home to ask for food, and we gave them some. But I didn't help them because I sympathize with them. I helped them out of fear of repression. The strangers in the mountains are viewed with suspicion. Who are these bearded, smelly strangers with guns making a noisome intrusion into their lives? Fidel Castro tries to convince the peasants to side with him and his men. He decided to impress upon the peasants that he would bring about an agrarian reform. And he did that by basically stealing a bunch of cows from landowners and liberating them and handing them over to the area's peasants. That was a fairly popular move. Castro decides it's time to make the rebel presence felt and plans for an attack on an army outpost in the area. Che is heading for his first battle. On January 22nd, 1957, the rebels stage an ambush on an army patrol. As the first shots ring out, Che is face to face with the enemy. He shot him when he saw him drop. And he seemed to be gauging his own reactions to see how he felt about it. And he felt fine. He felt fine. The small group is now faced with having to execute one of their own. The traitor, a man called Eutimio Guerra, one of their first collaborators, was discovered to be a spy. Fidel sentenced this man to death. No one ever said who had executed Eutimio Guerra, but in Che's personal diary, it emerged that he had, and he described it in vivid detail. Taking the man's possessions from him, exchanging words from him, and then Che stepping up to his side. There was a thunderstorm breaking just then, and placing a revolver at his temple and blowing his brains out, the 25 caliber revolver. Che inspected the entry and exit wound, very much the doctor writing down that he had slept fine with what he had done. From that moment on, Che changed. War is harsh, and at a time when the enemy was intensifying its aggressiveness, one could not tolerate even the suspicion of treason. I don't know the final tally of execution victims of Che Guevara, but it was certainly dozens. February 17, 1957. Hiding out in the Cuban jungle, a small band of revolutionaries led by Fidel Castro contends with the constant threat of army ambushes and traitors in their midst. But thanks in part to Che Guevara's ruthlessness, the group is slowly gaining in strength and fierce reputation. Fidel Castro's troops and their exploits soon catch the attention of the world press. A newspaper editor named Herbert Matthews from uh, the New York Times, who had got smuggled up to meet him. Castro gave the impression to Herbert Matthews that he had like 100 to 150 men. In fact, the mighty rebel army is made up of only 20 men. When the article is published a month later, it confirms that Fidel and Che have survived the initial attack by Batista's forces and that their movement is thriving in the Sierra Maestra. In response, Batista deploys 1,500 more soldiers to hunt down the rebels. On March 25th, Batista's army arrived at my house. They surrounded my home and opened fire because I had been reported as a collaborator with the rebel army. They killed my wife. That's why I joined the rebel army. Meanwhile, July 26th urban members sign up reinforcements. One of the new city recruits is Chuck Ryan, 
a 19-year-old American attending high school at Guantanamo Bay, where his father works as a U.S. Marine Corps medic. We had a large society with the Cubans. We were all friends, and we went to their weddings and their baptisms and things like that. I offered to help them to get gun supplies to fight against the dictatorship. Soon, Chuck and two other teenagers from Guantanamo are invited to join the rebels. So we talked about it and settled a few things and left letters for our parents. The American teens, along with 50 other new recruits, are taken into the Sierra Maestra. One of the first people they meet is Che. I think that the, the real reason they said Che was those men that we came with, many of them were, were very ill because it took us 30 hours of walking to get up those hills with those packs. There are other American volunteers. One of them is 18-year-old Don Saldini. Whole rebel army, including Fidel, Che, Raul, and my group was estimated to consist of 300 men. Life within the rebel camp is not easy. I had no soles on my boots. We ate when we could. Sometimes we didn't have water. We marched for oh, a couple of hundred miles over the mountains. I was uh, plagued with dysentery and what have you. In the jungles of Cuba, the rebels are vulnerable to all types of health problems, which Che treats. We would get large infected mosquito bites on our legs and things. And he would come over and take the scabs off and put sulfa powder on there. Men were pretty scared of being treated by him. They called him uh, Dr. Sacamuelas, tooth puller. He was pretty rough. He was not known for his delicacy. Along with his doctor's duties, Che proves himself repeatedly on the battlefield. It's been said in more hands-on fashion than Fidel. Che was a true model in front of us. While Fidel looked for a place of refuge to hide himself, Che was bare-chested. He always rushed to the front lines during battles. His willingness to confront death, to take life, to risk his own life, came together to form a charisma that was highly unusual and which gave him an almost legendary reputation. And he emerged as a man which others feared and also respected and admired. Seeing how well Che conducts himself in battle, Fidel promotes him to commandant on July 12, 1957, and gives him his first military command of 75 men, known as Column Number 4. The vanity which we all have in us made me the proudest man in the world that day. There were those who fell under his leadership and charisma, and particularly very young boys, you have to call them, 15, 16 year olds. Some of them were runaways who became his disciples, and they became known as Los Cachorros del Che, Che's cubs. He was everything to them, an older brother, a father, a guerrilla leader, an instructor, very much the ideologue. He gave them literacy lessons. He wanted them to read and write. Others do their best not to attract his attention. He could punish someone for three to six days without food for something minor. This character and furious discipline of his makes me believe it was fear that we had of him. We feared that he would impose upon us a punishment. By October, Che has a new base in La Mesa. With this freedom, Che starts to organize the area, starting an armory, bakery, butcher shop, and even a newspaper called El Cubano Libre. By February 1958, they are broadcasting messages on their own radio station, Radio Rebelde. Not all the guerrillas know they are fighting a communist revolution. Fidel nunca nos ha dicho. If Fidel had told us that it was a communist movement, all of the recruits would have abandoned him, for sure. There was a lot of concern about Castro's power and, and uh, rhetoric uh, and who he was. He was a bit of a mystery at that time. 
the CIA and the U.S. military continued to give Batista weapons. The Sierra Maestra swarms with Batista's troops, yet the rebels maintain the upper hand, having gained enormous support from the local population. Batista's army was on the ropes, and it was to Che that Fidel looked to take the war to the north. After 18 months in the Sierras, it's time to expand the war to the other parts of Cuba. Che Guevara and his column march 370 miles to Las Vias province, strategically positioned near Santa Clara, Cuba's fourth largest city, just four hours from Havana. In late 1958, that he met Aleda March. She was a supporter of the July 26th movement. Aleda had smuggled weapons and messages from the cities to Che's camp. But on one such mission, her cover is blown. She ended up staying in the mountains and joining Che. And in the course of the coming weeks, as they left the Escambray to do battle against Batista's army in the towns around Santa Clara, they became lovers. Meanwhile, the guerrilla war intensifies. Fidel Castro and his rebel army, now of about 800 men, begin to move through Orient province, while Che attacks army garrisons using psychological guerrilla tactics to scare away the enemy. On Monday, at one in the morning, one rebel went and took one shot into the garrison and got, of course, this massive firepower response. Then went home or went to sleep or went to do something else. The next night, a couple of rebels, one at 11 o'clock and one at 4 in the morning, did the same thing, one shot. By the third night, that garrison was always up and not sleeping. They basically made these people just want to leave. And it's sure, after about two weeks, that garrison just abandoned camp and went into, into town. You're in a situation where you're thinking you're, you're fighting a superior enemy. That morale-wise, that cannot be very good. I think that definitely affected the Batista army. On December 27, 1958, Fidel Castro orders Che to assault Santa Clara, Batista's last holdout, with 340 fighters against an enemy force 10 times the size. The troops were drilled. They knew what they were doing. They knew they had a good commander. They had Che who was top of the line. They trusted him. We had been monitoring um, shortwave, the Radio Rebelde and from Santa Clara, from where Che was. And uh, the news didn't sound good. The rebel transmission, but they're getting clobbered. But the reports are mistaken. They're fighting against an army, which is larger, but the people that are conscripted into the army are really very, very poor people. They have no stake in Batista staying in power. Realizing the futility of resistance, they surrendered, and more than 100 guns passed over to the side of freedom. The final blow to Batista's forces come when Che and his men ambush an armored train, bringing reinforcements to Santa Clara. On December 31st, 1958, Batista fled Havana with his entourage and several millions of dollars in cash. As news of Batista's departure spreads, troops begin to surrender. Fidel ordered Che to march on Havana from Santa Clara, while he himself made a more leisurely victory parade the length of the island. 32-year-old Fidel Castro and his rebel army arrive in Havana on January 8, 1959. Today, all eyes, those of the powerful oppressors and those of the hopeful, are fixed on us. Che's dream is for a united socialist Latin America, a new world order that will not sit well with the United States. To attain it, Che will spread revolution across the continent. But first, more blood will be shed. January 2nd, 1959, Havana, Cuba. After a two-year hit-and-run war against the forces of Cuban President Fulgencio Batista, a guerrilla force led by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara has now gained control over Cuba. In Havana, it will be Che's job to keep the new revolutionary government in power by targeting and purging any opposition. 
As Cuban President Fulgencio Batista flees in defeat, Fidel Castro and his rebel army make a triumphant entry into Havana. We were received as liberators, celebrated. I mean, people ran out with bottles of rum. People went wild. I think it was a marvelous experience. I think for the first time in my life, we were able to see the people of Cuba united with one vision, one love, and that it was the most beautiful thing you can see in Cuban history. After two years of living in the mountains, the rebels find the temptations of Havana hard to resist. Che had to issue stricter orders on the behavior of his young men who, arriving in Havana for the first time, finding all of these beautiful young women, in essence, throwing themselves at them. It was, as Aleda described it to me, something of an orgy taking place, particularly in the bushes below the great statue of Christ. Che's wife, Hilda, had not seen him since the guerrilla campaign began two years earlier. She flies to Havana with their daughter, unaware that there is another woman in his life. And immediately he told her that he was no longer in love with her and he wanted a divorce. Che was married to Aleda just a couple of months later in a small ceremony with Raul Castro acting as one of his witnesses. As Che puts his personal life in order, Fidel Castro begins to implement the first major changes in Cuba. Well, in the beginning, most of the population expect, was expecting a, a change. Castro, always, he was in the mountains. He promised a uh, election, free election, in 18 months. There is not communism or Marxism in our ideas. We will not seize any land from anybody. Yet on February 16th, just two months after the rebels' victory, Fidel Castro was sworn in as prime minister, and the elections never take place. Then certain segments of the professional class and the elite and the middle class began to view Fidel Castro and his regime with uh, suspicion. There was a debate that started almost from the day Castro took power about whether he was a communist or not. And part of this debate focused on Che Guevara, who obviously did get on the radar screen pretty quickly of the CIA. Fearing that an alliance with the known communists could jeopardize his position, Fidel Castro keeps Che at a distance. He ordered Che to take over the La Cabana Fortress, which is an old colonial garrison overlooking Havana Harbor and the city. That was where the war criminals were tried. Che orders executions of those found guilty. In essence, carrying on with what he had been doing in the war, um, summary trials for torturers, for men accused of war crimes, and carrying out their execution, firing squad executions in La Cabana. The American guerrilla Neil McCauley had spent several months with the rebels and helped train the soldiers. He is approached by the commander of the firing squad on its first round of executions. I said, look, this is a matter for Cubans. You guys do it. And he said, no, but look, they make a mess of it. We need somebody who's at least going to hit the mark. I was prevailed upon. I, I did. I didn't, I didn't mind. I mean, I'm glad to shoot these guys. And so I, I walked out there. I took command of the firing squad. I directed him against him. And I mean, this this time, killed him. And then the next guy who came up, I, I took that one too. Over the next 18 months, hundreds, some say thousands of people are executed by firing squad. The killings help cement Che's terrifying reputation. Both of them, they are killers, they are murderers. Castro has killed thousands of people, and Che Guevara has killed thousands of people, too. So Che was a devil. Along with the guilty, some claim that many innocent men are also executed. That's the reason why uh, a lot of people hate him so much, because he caused so many, so many families to grieve. Were innocents killed? Possibly, I don't know of any particularly. What this did, though, is it showed that Fidel meant business. Don't mess with the revolution. Cuba's a dangerous place. As Che continues with the war tribunals, 
The same questions in the United States regarding the new regime are being asked across the globe by Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. My father asked uh, intelligence, KGB, his political analyst, who are these guys? They was answered that the uh, one Am Central American dictator replaced another Central American dictator. For sure, they're pro-United States and maybe they're agent of CIA. It was no idea that they can be uh, socialism. Realizing he has to appease U.S. concerns, Fidel Castro travels to Washington on April 15, 1959. He met with Vice President Nixon, claimed famously to the American press that he was not a Marxist, denied it, and said he was a democratic humanist. Fidel, at least in those initial months, kept everyone guessing. But behind the scenes, Fidel Castro had already aligned with Cuba's Communist Party. It'll always be an open question whether Fidel became a Marxist himself because of pragmatic opportunity or evolved over time. There is no doubt Fidel Castro was influenced by Che's ideological convictions. Che was vital in being a sounding board and an advisor to Fidel uh, during the key years in the Sierra when he built up his role as the revolutionary strongman and also in turning him leftward. Fidel Castro shares Che's ideology and determination in changing the course of Cuba. Secretly, he had Che and some of his more radical colleagues um, meeting and privately drafting the outlines of the future communist state of Cuba. The government begins to prepare for Cuba's agrarian reform law, which calls for the seizure of private property. But before the plan is implemented, Che is sent overseas. So to American spies watching Cuba, and even a lot of Cubans, they thought that, ah, Fidel has marginalized Che. He's gotten that radical out of the way. June 12, 1959, Che leaves Cuba to visit Asia, Africa, and Europe and makes his first contacts with the Soviet Union. He offers them a deal the U.S. had rejected to buy several million tons of Cuban sugar. It was uh, the rule of the uh, Cold War, even if that you don't think that these people will be your allies or your friends, but if they're trying to do something uh, negative to your enemy, you have to help them. The Soviets agree to buy what the Americans won't. They need weapons, so Soviet Union started to sell their old Soviet tanks and some uh, fighters, airplanes. The Soviets also supply them with oil, which U.S.-owned refineries in Cuba refused to process. Che had a public face and a clandestine existence, which was understood and encouraged by Fidel. And rewarded by him, Che is given an important new role in the Cuban government as head of the Industrialization Department and is appointed president of Cuba's National Bank. He showed his disdain for the mercantile world and money by merely signing the Cuban bank bills. Che. To me, was an insult to the Cuban people when he signed the first currency, like, uh, and he signed Che Guevara. That was an insult. The capitalist structure of Cuba is coming to an end. Castro, he decreased the standard of living, so instead of making richer everybody, he made poor everybody. Fidel Castro signs an agrarian reform bill and on May 7, 1959, the first seizures of large agricultural land holdings are made. The people, they start to see the reality, what's coming on. And pretty soon, the Cubans, they start the exodus to Miami. As thousands flee Cuba, Che takes on an even more radical plan. A favorite argument of Che's was that in order for Cuba to become truly 
politically sovereign, it had to become economically independent of the United States. And the only way to do that was to sever all economic links with the United States. The United States has billions of dollars invested in Cuba. Everything was owned by the United States. The electricity company, the ports, the mines, the twice daily airline shuttle to Miami, the television stations. With America's refusal to refine Cuba's oil, Fidel Castro responds by nationalizing all foreign oil companies. In retaliation, the U.S. breaks all diplomatic relations. Less than 10 months later, all U.S.-owned companies are seized. Washington fights back and announces a trade embargo on all exports to Cuba. As tensions rise with the U.S., in Cuba, any opposition to the regime is viewed as counter-revolutionary and a crime. Even the practice of religion is frowned upon. Several dozen Catholic priests are expelled from the island. Over a Bible, they promise to fight until uh, we had Cuba free or until death. And mainly the uh, founders of our of that organization, my organization, they die in front of the uh, firing squad. Killings were terrible, everywhere. I didn't want to live under a regime like that, and uh, my wife didn't want to. As thousands flee Cuba, the stage for confrontation with the United States is set. Fidel Castro's revolutionary government can no longer be tolerated. Frankly, he's uncontrollable, and that was the key. We cannot control him. You see the clear CIA memoranda saying Fidel Castro has to be eliminated and the Cuban Revolution has to be rolled back and we need to go forward with a plan to overthrow uh, the Castro government. As Che Guevara's vision for a socialist Cuba becomes a reality, President Eisenhower meets behind closed doors. The time for action has come. A secret war is about to begin. Within a year of Fidel Castro coming to power, the capitalist economy in Cuba has crumbled. Che Guevara is directly involved in seizing land. Foreign interests are nationalized. Thousands of Cubans are leaving. Relations with the U.S. sour, and Cuba sets its sights on the Soviet Union. America takes action. A plan has been presented to President Eisenhower, and he signs it. A covert operations program to invade Cuba goes forward. The U.S. responded to the radicalization in Cuba by building up its biggest ever CIA base in Miami, recruiting thousands of Cuban exiles to work for it. One of the CIA's recruits was a young man called Felix Rodriguez. Born and raised in Cuba, Felix's family fled to Miami after Fidel Castro came to power. I learned that they were training camp to go and fight Castro, uh, so I joined them. Uh, and I was then 18. The Cuban exiles train in Guatemala under the direction of the CIA, and a smaller group is sent into Cuba. Our team infiltrated Cuba before the invasion to work with the resistance. Back in the United States, John F. Kennedy is sworn into office on January 3rd, 1961. At the very first meeting, the CIA director for the Western Hemisphere said, unless you eliminate Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, and Che Guevara as part of this plan, you are never going to win. This is going to be one long, drawn-out affair. Kennedy agrees. Not only will he support the CIA plan to invade Cuba, but CIA assassination plots as well. So in August of 1960, a very high CIA official named Richard Bissell authorized the CIA to create uh, poison pills that would then be sent to mafia contacts inside Cuba and, and somehow put in Fidel's food. Although the assassination attempts are unsuccessful, the plan to invade Cuba begins on April 15, 1961. It was in the course of the fighting that Fidel finally showed his true colors and announced that he was socialist, Marxist-Leninist, that the regime henceforth was going to be allied to the Soviet Union. 
Fidel Castro gives Che command of Cuba's Western Army, but the invasion comes further south in an area called Playa Giron, the Bay of Pigs. As the 1,500-man Cuban exile army known as Brigade 2506 approached the island on April 17, 1961, their boats are sunk by Castro's Air Force. We was waiting some support, like uh, air, air support, uh, Navy support, but nothing of that happened. Within 48 hours, uh, this force was largely uh, decimated. Che had been far from the action, but he and Fidel Castro are credited with fighting off the Americans. And there were heroes for everybody, in school, in the universities, on the Soviet leadership. For America's new president, the invasion is a disaster. It was a famous meeting between Che Guevara and a Kennedy aide named Richard Goodwin. The first thing he said to Goodwin was, thank you for the Bay of Pigs. It allowed our revolution to consolidate. Before the invasion, we were a somewhat you know, fragmented, young government. But after the revolution, our victory and the kind of nationalist fervor that your invasion caused has allowed us to truly move forward far more stronger than we had been before. It backfired in every conceivable way uh, possible. Fidel Castro and Che are convinced that America will invade again and turn to the Soviets for protection. My father told, we cannot uh, protect Cuba using our conventional forces. So it must be signal. If you invade Cuba, you will be in trouble because we are serious. The last discussion about deploying missiles in Cuba, it was in Che Guevara and Khrushchev. It's not long before the Soviet missiles installed in Cuba are detected. It was a very, very dangerous time. Fidel Castro and Che pushed the Soviets to launch the missiles in the event of an American ground invasion. Castro was so aggressive that Khrushchev totally cut him out of the loop on these negotiations. Without consulting Castro or Che, Khrushchev makes a deal with Kennedy. American would never invade Cuba. We will take our missiles out. To Fidel Castro and Che, it is an act of absolute betrayal. I mean, it was Che who was the first Cuban official face to face with a Soviet official to kind of basically read the Soviets, the riot act. Disillusioned with the Soviets, Che realizes he has to establish other strong left-wing partnerships. He finds what he's looking for in China. You have the extreme revolutionaries, Maoist, and Che Guevara, he belonged to this extreme. Che is impressed by Mao Zedong's plans to take China from an agrarian society to a modern communist one. Che wants to do the same for Cuba. He has an ideal vision of the new socialist man, one who contributes for the greater good, not personal profit. Now in our Cuba, work is acquiring a new meaning and is done with a new joy. The idea was to create a new man who was willing to sacrifice himself on behalf of others to build a socialist paradise through hard work and dedication. He very often even slept in his office. And even famous visitors remark finding him there, sometimes asleep on the floor. He instituted a volunteer labor program whereby on his only free day, he would go off to cut cane himself. He urges his colleagues to do the same. He became renowned in Havana as a, a bit of a party pooper. His wife, Aleda, and their four kids are also subjected to his rigid ideology. He was austere and severe at home. He refused to let his wife, Aleda, have the benefits of his ministry car. She had to take the bus. If she was given a gift by a foreign dignitary, she had to return them. Che also has other more adventurous campaigns in mind. Che wanted to focus uh, much more on uh, international revolution. So he began to revive his hopes of extending 
the socialist revolution to other parts of Latin America as a way to create breathing space, open up a new lung for Cuba and the hemisphere. He began to be seen increasingly by the Soviets as a kind of dangerous radical who was pro-Chinese. They were critical of him with Fidel. Che realizes the situation in Cuba is getting complicated and starts making plans to leave. Che understood that Fidel was entirely now dependent on the Soviet Union economically, and it was up to him to sally forth and revolutionize the socialist world. To succeed, he will have to confront the Soviets, risk his relationship with Fidel Castro, and put himself on the front lines. By 1963, Cuba's economy has hit an all-time low. Che Guevara's plans to propel the country forward have failed. His solution is to end Cuba's reliance on the Soviets and spread the revolution around the world. Che became increasingly disenchanted with the way things were shaping up to be in Cuba as a Soviet satellite. August 1964, the Lyndon Johnson administration's attention is diverted from Cuba to Vietnam and the increasing turmoil in Africa. The Cubans also have their eyes on Africa, particularly on what had been the former Belgian Congo. The Congo lay at the heart of Africa. It could be a kind of motor or heart for uh, socialist revolution, which could radiate outward and liberate the hemisphere. President Kasavubu's government, backed by the CIA, fights a rebel group called the Congolese National Liberation Movement. The CIA creates an army of about, on average, 1,000 mercenaries, half from South Africa and Rhodesia, the other half from Europe. And the Cubans felt that they should go and support the forces who were fighting the United States-backed groups. The impression Che Guevara got was of a revolt that was still very strong and with very committed leaders. With the Congo in mind as a place ripe for revolution, Che heads to New York and the country he has for so long despised. He came to the United States in December of 1964 and addressed the United Nations. Total de los artefactos termonucleares y apoyamos la celebración de una conferencia de todos los países del mundo para llevar a cabo estas aspiraciones de los pueblos. Wearing the green fatigues of the revolution, he criticizes the U.S. involvement in Vietnam and the conflict in the Congo. Next, an appearance on Face the Nation. Che continues to the North African city of Algiers, where he makes a speech openly criticizing the Soviet Union. Che, in essence, broke his sword with the Soviets. When he returns to Havana, Che and Fidel Castro have a closed-door meeting having blasted the Soviets, who were, after all, the hand that fed Cuba, having bitten them in the hand. And Fidel had to say, Che, I think it's time you go. And I think Che said, I think it's time too. Che hopes he can win back favor by leading a successful campaign in the Congo. The mission is to help support and train rebels in guerrilla warfare. Che had Fidel's blessing, and he essentially disappeared from the domestic political map of, of Cuba. Che and his men arrive on the Congolese shore of Lake Tanganyika on April 24th, 1965. First of all, in the Congo, nothing was prepared. There was no chief. There were no men ready to fight. In the case of the Congolese rebel leader, Laurent Kabila, he actually visited the front himself only once. Kabila arrived in a speedboat with a couple of prostitutes and several bottles of whiskey. Che's own Cubans almost mutinied on him once they saw the kind of men they were fighting alongside. The few men that were there, when we gave them the weapons, they didn't know what they were receiving. They had no knowledge of weapons or ideology. They didn't know anything. Che hopes he can get the rebels into shape and stages a few successful raids. But 
but loses six of his own men in the process. Che had not been seen in almost a year. CIA believed that he had died or might have even been killed when he left Cuba. October 3rd, 1965, responding to speculation that he had ordered Che's death, Fidel Castro reads a letter Che has written to him. I feel that I have fulfilled the part of my duty that tied me to the Cuban Revolution and its territory. And I say goodbye to you, to the comrades, to your people, who are now mine. I formally resign my positions in the leadership of the party, my post as minister, my rank of commander, and my Cuban citizenship. Nothing legal binds me to Cuba. Che had not expected the letter to be read publicly. The day that Fidel read that letter is when we found out about it. It was a very difficult moment. He was neither the Cuban nor African leader. Che himself was going through a very dark period. While there, he received the news that his mother had died. He was very close to his mother, and that was really hard on him. He had turned into a withdrawn man. He didn't talk. He was always alone, sitting on a tree trunk. He was in a bad mood, and he spoke very little with us. By mid-October, government forces and mercenaries advance. His camp was nearly overrun. Rebel resistance collapsed. And at the same time, what you have is the decision of the government of Tanzania that they're no longer going to support this war. Fidel urges Che to abandon the mission and bring his fighters home. Their retreat from the Congo was ignominious. That's how he dis himself described it. They just barely escaped with their lives. Admitting defeat, Che holds up at the embassy in Tanzania and then moves to a safe house in Prague. Fidel sent couriers to him, urging him to reconsider and return. Che refused. He refused to go back to Cuba after having given his word that he would go off and, if necessary, die to lead other revolutions elsewhere. After some time, Fidel told Che that he had brokered a deal with the head of the Bolivian Communist Party for him to go to Bolivia. He jumps at the chance. In Bolivia, Che's plan is to train a guerrilla force to start a liberation war that would spread all across the hemisphere. What he hoped to do was to spark off enough guerrilla insurgencies around the world that would attract American firepower, distract it from Vietnam, and ultimately sap it of its strength, and to overturn the world order once and for all. He was trying to start World War III. A war that will wipe out capitalism and install communism in its place. If he was successful, he'd be able to change the world. I don't think Che ever really contemplated failure. After the failed mission in the Congo and his farewell letter to Fidel Castro read publicly, Che Guevara refuses to return to Cuba without a success. His plans to expand the revolution bring him to Bolivia. November, 1966. Che arrives in La Paz in a convincing disguise. Che had all of his hair plucked out one by one, and an identity was created for him as a traveling salesman, a man in his mid-fifties. He makes his way to a base in Nancuazu, where he meets Loyola Guzman and other members of the Bolivian Communist Party. The encounter with him was a surprise because of rumors that he was held prisoner in Cuba, that Fidel was going to kill him, that he was leading guerrillas in other countries. Che explains the mission to the group. He explained the objective, which was an armed struggle in many Latin American countries, to make one, two, many Vietnams. But soon, Che changes the plans. Instead of using Bolivia as a base to start revolutions in other countries, Bolivia will be used as the starting point for the revolution, which he himself will lead. 
party secretary general at that time, Mr. Monge, went into the camp and spoke with Che Guevara. And he told him that the only chance they could have was if the Bolivian Communist Party, Moscow Line, would, would take the lead of this movement. Che refuses to give up his position of leadership. The party has taken up arms against us, and I do not know where this will lead, but it will not stop us. But the loss of support from Monge's group leaves Che with only 24 soldiers. They include some of his old Cuban comrades. By the time they arrive in Bolivia, Che's disguise is well grown out. When we arrived, there was none of what Fidel had promised was there. There was no food, ammo, medicine or anything. To make matters even worse, the peasant support the movement had so relied on in Cuba is nowhere to be found in Bolivia. We had a land reform in 1952, so every peasant was the owner of his own piece of land. We had a democratic government and we had free press. The Chaco region of Bolivia, where Che has chosen to begin his campaign, is also unwelcoming. There was no vegetation, no animals. There were no farmers. Yet Che continues with his plans. If he could succeed in Cuba, he could do the same in Bolivia. March 19, 1967. Che and his men are joined by a few old acquaintances. They include French Marxist Régis Debray and two longtime supporters of the revolution, artist Ciro Bustos and a former East German spy and suspected KGB operative named Tanya. Firmly committed to the communist cause, Tanya is the only link between the guerrillas and the outside world. Tanya. Tanya was the one who searched for everything before starting battle, from clothes, shoes, food, ammo, and everything. She quickly mobilized and got everything. She reached the highest levels of the Bolivian government. But on one trip to the jungles, her cover is blown. Tanya is forced to stay with the guerrillas, but for some, the conditions are too difficult. The first information came from the deserters. But that confirmed the information about foreigners in the region, armed and with intentions of creating a guerrilla force. The army sends a patrol of 40 men into the area. And that were, patrol was ambushed by the guerrillas. And on uh, the 10th of April, we had another two ambushes. Two patrols were ambushed taken by the guerrillas. Che decides to split the group in two. A rebel leader named Joaquin will take the rear guard, while Che joins the vanguard. He instructs Regis Debray and Ciro Bustos to try to get a message out to Fidel Castro. In their attempt to do so, they're captured and taken prisoner by Bolivian armed forces. Sergeant Miguel Arroyo interrogates them. Bustos practically spoke voluntarily because he was very worried. We gave him food and he talked. Bustos drew images of the Cuban guerrillas without naming them. And that's when they were able to see Guevara's profile with the beard and his pipe. Regis Debray confirms Che's identity. When he resurfaced in Bolivia in 19... 67, you see the CIA intelligence reports saying, well, I guess we were wrong in thinking that he might have been dead these last several years because it appears that he's alive and well and, and promoting revolution in the jungles of Bolivia. The CIA sends a couple of agents to Bolivia in June 1967. One of them is Felix Rodriguez, the man who at age 18 had trained for the Bay of Pigs and had volunteered to assassinate Fidel Castro and Che. The Bolivian government was sure that he was trying to promote the guerrilla in the area. With evidence of Che trying to start a guerrilla war in his country, Bolivian President Barrientos starts a propaganda campaign against them. They would say that if we went out, we would be mugged and raped by guerrilla fighters. That's what would be rumored. With Che Guevara back on the radar, America begins to gear up to help the Bolivians. It is absolutely clear that the CIA made this number one priority uh, in the summer of 1967. 
Lyndon Johnson was monitoring day by day the progress that was being made in tracking down uh, and uh, eliminating uh, the great revolutionary Che Guevara. A legacy of Kennedy's presidency is the creation of an elite counterinsurgency group known as the Green Berets. They're deployed to Bolivia. The mission was to train from scratch a Bolivian Ranger Battalion, specifically trained in tactics, to go after uh, Che Guevara and his guerrillas. 800 Bolivian soldiers are selected and trained at a camp called La Esperanza. Metodicamente, no? We were like kids in a toy store, practicing with real war munitions, particularly machine guns, rifles, hand grenades, rockets. They were willing students, they were enthusiastic. They turned out to be good soldiers. As things heat up in Bolivia, Che decides it's time to leave, but not without all his comrades. It's been four months since Che's column has seen the rear guard. They had stayed behind at base camp with the sick, including Tanya. She was physically in pretty poor shape. She had a uterus cancer that was eating her. And there was a report from the gorilla that she was delaying the movement of the gorilla because she could hardly walk. Che wants to link up with the group to make their way towards the Andes for their final escape. Only days apart, both groups begin to move separately towards the Rio Grande. On August 31st, Joaquin's column gets there first. And they contacted a peasant to show them how to cross the river. But the peasant betrays them and informs the army exactly where Joaquin plans to cross. And when this group was crossing the river, he ambushed them. And killed them, including Tania, the only woman on the group. She was shot through both arms, went through the whole body, and she, her body went right into the water. And basically, the whole guerrilla was annihilated, with the exception of two guys. Once his comrades in the second column were wiped out, the story of Che Guevara in Bolivia was really a survival story after that. A kind of epic journey. They moved from a beastly, hot, thorny wilderness up into the high Andes. Underfed, under ambush, sick. By September, 39-year-old Che and his men have been moving through the harsh Bolivian jungles for 10 months. Che had lost almost half his body weight. His hair was matted and long. His men were hallucinating. Juan Pablo Chen was practically blind. Paco was now crazy. He was mentally insane. Willie didn't want to fight anymore. It was all terrible. Che sends Benigno to get some much-needed supplies. As they approach the village of La Higuera, they run into an army ambush. We automatically went from 22 men to 17. We lost three. They got me. The bullet entered here and stayed here by the medulla. I was able to return to where Che was located. Wounded, sick, and exhausted, the guerrillas move slowly through a ravine near La Higuera. On October 8th, they're spotted by a local farmer who reports back to an army officer. The 2nd Ranger Battalion is immediately deployed to the area. Everyone had to get their weapons and get ready. One of the columns was so large that it had 650 soldiers transporting during the night. So I got about 70 men with me and went down to La Higuera and from there to the ravine. As the Bolivian rangers descend the mountains, Che realizes he and his men are trapped. They'll have to fight their way out. We received five from the guerrillas. Two soldiers were killed. So we started fighting. The guerrillas are clearly outnumbered. Some of the guerrillas were killed. Che himself was wounded, and his rifle was literally shot out of his hand. He was incapable of firing it. A Bolivian gorilla named Willie comes to his aid, trying to lead him to safety. I had two soldiers for security about 15 meters up. They had seen these two guys trying to get out of the ravine, coming slowly, and they waited. They were right up to them. 
the two guerrillas have nowhere to run. One thing that caught my attention was he was carrying a small pan with six eggs. He was very careful with these six eggs, probably because he was going to his food for the next days. No? So I asked him, who are you? And he said to me, look, I am Che, and, and I'm worth more alive than dead. It has taken an army to catch him, but Che Guevara has finally been caught. The Bolivians are hungry for blood, yet the only ones who can save him are the ones who Che hates the most. October 8, 1967, after 11 months on the run, Che Guevara's dreams of revolution have come to a bloody end in the Bolivian jungles. We knew Che had been taken prisoner. We planned an escape to get out and report what had occurred, the truth about Bolivia. With most of his men dead, Che and Willie, a rebel soldier, are escorted out of the ravine. I gave him a soldier to lean on, and he walked all the way. It's an arduous hike. It takes several hours, and they took him to La Higuera, where he was placed in the little mud-walled schoolhouse there. They had put Che in the place where I worked, and they guarded him in a very responsible manner. Curious, local school teacher Julia Cortez asks to see the prisoner in her classroom. He was an extraordinarily handsome man. He wasn't the man depicted to us. Black, ugly, evil. His eyebrows, his nose, his mouth, all of his features were perfect. I then went to my home and brought back a small bowl of soup which I brought to his cell. No one stopped me from doing so. He drank it with pleasure and thanked me. He said it was worth gold. Captain Gary Prado also speaks to Che. I asked him, why didn't you give up a few weeks ago? Why didn't you just disband your guerrilla? Where would I go, he said. And that was his real drama. He had no place to go. Back in Valle Grande, CIA agent Felix Rodriguez and the other Bolivian commanders received the news. That evening we celebrated. I bought a couple of bottles of scotch and uh, they celebrated. The next day, Felix Rodriguez and Bolivian Colonel Zentano arrive in La Higuera. As you enter the room here on the left side, it was the tie down in the floor and in front of him was the dead body of two Cubans. Uh, he has lost, he looks like, like a beggar. You feel sorry, pity at uh, the way he looked. Uh, I mean, he was a total disaster. Colonel Centeno tries to question Che. What are you doing? Colonel Centeno was the one who did the talking. I just stood there with the other officer, and he started asking questions to Che, and Che would not answer him. Until Centeno got mad and said, well, you are a foreigner. You came to my country. The least you can do is answer me. And he would not answer him. So he left the room. Felix sends a message that Che Guevara has been captured. The message has to be routed via CIA stations in various South American nations. It will take hours for the message to arrive in Washington. Felix returns to the schoolhouse to see if Che will speak with him. Whenever I tried to touch tactical interest to us, how many people he had with him, where he had come from, uh, he would smile to me and say, you know, I cannot answer that. A lot of time, to be honest with you, I was not even paying attention to what he was saying. I was, my mind was running the image that I have seen him so many times uh, next to Mao Zedong and, and the Soviet leaders and the uh, uniform and, and, and the way he looked at that point in time. I mean, it was the way a striking uh, situation, a unique situation, really. Felix takes Che outside and poses with him for a photograph. And at that point in time, I felt that, you know, his life was going to be a spare. A short time later, Gunshots ring out from the schoolhouse. I thought they had shot Che. So I, I run back, I open the door and he look at me, I look at him and then I run to the next door and then I saw Willie who was, you know, just dying at that point in time. And then the soldier who shot him told me, the Capitan, he tried to escape, which is ridiculous. I mean, he, he received order to execute him. Later that morning, 
A message comes in from Bolivian High Command in La Paz to the highest ranking officer on site. Colonel Centeno was in the field, all the captain was were, were with him. And there were only two lieutenants and myself. I had the rank of captain in La Higuera, so they called me. The Bolivians had a numbered code. We knew from advance that 500 was she, 600 was dead, and 700 was to keep him alive. So I asked them to repeat it, that they confirmed there was 500, 600 from the high command. And that's why I received the order 500, 600. Colonel Zenteno returns to La Higuera. Felix talks to him about reversing the order. Colonel, there are orders from your command to eliminate the prisoner. The order from my government is to try to keep him alive at all costs, and we have helicopters and mobility to move him out of here to Panama. But the Bolivians won't back down. Che is too much of a liability. They want him dead. Very early, we heard the radio news that Che had been captured and that he was dead. Felix is approached by Julia Cortez, the school teacher. Julia Cortez came to where I was and said, Mi Capitan, Mi Capitan, why are you going to shoot him? He said, Senora, why do you say that? She showed me the radio and said, the radio is giving the information that he already died from combat wounds. So at that point in time, I, th I thought there was no point in waiting any longer. With no word from Washington and Bolivia's president demanding Che's death, Felix decides to proceed with the execution order. It was their decision, their war, and he attacked their country. So it was their responsibility, and I should not interfere with that and let history continue its course. Only a day after Che Guevara's capture, the Bolivian government orders his death. News reports falsely claim he has been killed in battle. Held in a cell with the dead bodies of his comrades, Che Guevara awaits his fate. 12.30 p.m. on October 9th, CIA agent Felix Rodriguez enters the schoolhouse. He was sitting in the bench. I stood in front of him and said, Commander, I'm sorry, I tried my best. He turned white like a piece of paper. But he composed himself and said, it's better this way. I should have never been captured alive. And I asked him, say, if I can't send a message, do you want anything for your family? And then he changed and said, then if you can't tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. Chase stood up. He thought that Rodriguez was going to kill him then and there. Felix told me that he then embraced Che uh, as a, a gesture to a kind of noble enemy, said goodbye, left the room. Rodriguez went out and asked for volunteers. Mario Turan, a young sergeant, steps forward. Came to where he was, but I knew he was to be executioner, and said, look, don't shoot from here up, shoot from here down, because he's supposed to die from combat wound. Turan enters the cell, ready to execute the rebel leader. When he sees Turan entering the room, he knows that this is the man that's going to kill him. You know when you look into your murderer's eyes. He knows he's about to die. When Tadan came in, he said, shoot, coward, you're only going to kill a man. In other words, you're not going to kill my ideas. Tadan fired several bursts into Che, and the first seemed to hit his arm. Che fell on the ground and bit his hand hard to avoid crying out. And then Tadan finished him off with another burst, something like nine bullets that entered his body. The fatal bullet entered his thorax and he um, asphyxiated on his own blood. A Captain Gary Prado and Captain Sergio Torrello came down and we all came into the room. And then Gary Prado said, Mi Capitan, I think we have finished with the guerrilla in Latin America. He wasn't even put in the helicopter. He was just tied to it. I saw it with my very own eyes. He was tied on with a rope. Before the helicopter leaves, a priest steps forward. He gave the last benediction. He's the man who is an atheist, who doesn't believe in God, and he did receive the benediction of the Catholic Church. Che's body is flown to the local hospital in Via Grande. People from miles around come to view the body. One of them is local portrait photographer, René Kadima. Mm. 
When I went in, there were about 10 soldiers guarding Che. I got on top of the washer to get a good angle, kneeled a bit, and took one of the best pictures circulating the world, I'm told. That evening, Felix meets with the top brass of the Bolivian army. One of the generals is concerned people may not believe this is really the body of Che Guevara. If Fidel Castro denied that this is Che Guevara, we need really a proof of it. And he said, uh, cause his head and put him for Malahai. He said, you are a head of a state, you cannot present the head of a human being as a proof. So he said, Colonel, cut both hands and put him for Malahai. So they cause both hands at this level. Che's hands are sent to Cuba as proof that he is dead. It was the next day when Che's body disappeared. Che's body, along with his dead comrades, have been secretly buried in an undisclosed place. It was a combination decision between the Bolivian president, the CIA, and the generals on the ground there. The idea was to deny Che a burial place where his followers would find him and be able to render tribute to him. October 18th, Fidel announces Che's death to the people of Cuba. When I heard that Che had died, I didn't believe it. I didn't think it was possible. Around the world, people demonstrate in protest against his execution. In death, Che's legend grows. His face has come to be the quintessential icon for youthful defiance of the status quo. Che's burial site remains a mystery for 28 years until author John Lee Anderson uncovers the truth. I had an interview with the retired general, Mario Vargas Salinas, and it occurred to me, almost in passing, just to ask him, so, where's Che's body? Which I knew to be a military secret. And much to my shock, he sat back down and said, well, look, I've been wanting to tell you about that. And he told me. The remains of seven bodies are found in Valle Grande. And I'll never forget going to this pit, and they just told me under their breath, said, John Lee, that's him. You're aware that you're looking at a crime scene, that an entire state had tried to cover up. And so you feel history just wash over you. And I felt great about revealing that history. Che and the others are finally laid to rest in a tomb in Santa Clara, Cuba, on the 30th anniversary of his death. His beautiful martyrdom helped uh, play out in nurturing and encouraging future generations of revolutionaries in Latin America and elsewhere. Yet Che's only real success as a revolutionary had been in Cuba. The problem is that he failed, and none of the things that he wanted to change uh, have been changed yet. Most of the people that had contact with Che Guevara and helping him in any sort of a way really pay the consequences. From the whole group in Bolivia, only three of us survived. Three of us Cubans. I am in part glad that Che did not live to see all the things that are now going on in Cuba. Because he would die of a heart attack, rage and disgust. Benigno now lives in exile in Paris and is considered a traitor in Cuba. Che is still remembered in Bolivia. Its socialist president, Evo Morales, is a critic of the United States. If we had a Che Guevara today, we would easily be undergoing huge transformations. His principles for life, sovereignty, for Latin America, for the people, it is these principles that we share and take with us as we go forward. Now is when we need a Che. Not so much for the armed force, but for the defense of humanity. Nobody talks about guerrilla warfare anymore today. It's all terrorism. It's not Che Guevara, it's Osama bin Laden and people like him. Che was almost a purist. He didn't agree with terrorism. There were no car bombs in Che's world of war. There were no suicide bombers. There was the idea of noble sacrifice. In the end, Che was a paradox, both someone whose social indignation and passion I can empathize with and understand, but someone whose cold logic at times and whose rhetoric, and sometimes whose actions, I found terrifying. 
someone whose aspirations were to change the world and who tried but ultimately failed. <laughs>